Hello everyone, uh, my name is Vishab and, and today me and Srikant are going to walk you through our STN disaggregation journey. As, as you can see how important redundancy is in cloud, you just had to bring up a backup laptop to get things going. Uh, so let me start uh, this uh, presentation with a brief introduction. This is, this is a joint work between multiple groups in Microsoft, Microsoft Azure and Research and, and our close collaboration with AMD and Pinsando. Moving on uh, to the, the first slide, which basically gives the introduction about how we do the STN in, in Azure today. Today in Azure, we have host-based STN, which is powered by, by VFP and hardware accelerators, which are sitting on FPGAs. This provides us uh, a flexible, low latency platform for doing all different kind of STN functions and transformations we do for our customers. This framework works well for our customers need it gives us flexibility to make changes and 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 do custom transformation at a very rapid pace so with this context into how we do stn in azure today let me quickly go into a slide which talks about what was our key motivation behind doing the the disaggregation in azure the first thing which really motivated us to look into the disaggregated stn solution in addition to the host networking solution we already have was requirements for full STN support for non-VM workloads. Our customers wanted to connect hardware storage appliances like NetApps, big massive supercomputers like Cray, and bunch of stuff from on-prem and private endpoints onto Azure. And they wanted the same level of functionality and richness of STN which we give for virtual machines for all of these workloads. The second key motivator for us was we wanted to enable network optimized virtual machines which can go beyond the capabilities we have on a single host. Today, uh, in, in host networking, if you have a host which is capable of, let's say, pumping 10 million flows, the best machine or the best VM you can create can, can do the same. It cannot go beyond that. And this gets worse when you have multiple VMs on the same host because now you need to partition that flow table across those, and, and that leads to these artificial limits on virtual machines where people are forced to buy more cores for VMs be just because they need more flows for VM. So we wanted to solve that problem in a, in a simple and effective way for our customers and give them virtual machines which do not have networking limits uh, in terms of flow scale and all, and we can scale those out on demand. So with these motivations in mind, we came with a solution which we'll refer to as SDN Appliance internal code name for this is, is Project Sirius. What we did in this appliance was created a, a switch effectively with a bunch of embedded DPUs in it. These DPUs are capable of doing hundreds and of millions of flows on per appliance, which effectively gives us a sweet spot where we, do not ha we have the flexibility of a smart switch, but scale of a DPU or, or a server. With this appliance, the moment we had this appliance inbuilt, all we really had to do was create a traffic steering logic which takes the traffic from any workload, whether it's a VM or a non-VM workload or on-prem or anything, steer it toward the appliance and appliance can do the policy match. And after that, whether it's a VM workload or a non-VM workload, policy evaluation stays the same and we can give the same richness of STN to all the workloads. This also complements our host architecture really well where we keep our hosts optimized for the general VM cases. And for the cases where we need super ultra perf VMs, we, we use the, the appliance and steer the traffic towards it. In addition to, to building this appliance with, with a different kind of technology, we also open sourced the, the STN transformations we do in Azure as part of the Sonic Dash effort, which brings the industry innovation towards building these appliances and DPUs. We are work, working with bunch of partners in the Sonic community to give us the, the rich API set of Dash and power of SDN. So with this context, I'll let Shrikant go into the more details and, and, and hopefully end up with a demo. Yeah. Thanks, Rishabh. So as, as Rishabh alluded, all cloud providers implement stateful network functions on FPGAs or smart NICs that are directly attached to the host. There are many kinds of these network functions that are actually running in the clouds. To get us all on the same page, 
I'll give you a simple example of a connection tracking or a stateful firewall. It blocks all incoming packets except those on connections that are initiated by the virtual machine. If you think about it, to do that, you have to maintain a connection dictionary. So the state is proportional to the connections. And if you don't do this function well, you cannot open new connections quickly or open a large number of connections. Let's see how clouds do on this simple function. We deploy a pair of virtual machines, Linux Ubuntu's, and run an application that opens TCP connections as fast as you can. The x-axis here is the virtual course, and the y-axis is the connections per second. Here are the results from the three public large clouds. No cloud achieves more than 300,000 connections per second. To this end, we are disaggregating. So the abstraction is really simple. The VM administrator gets a floating NIC. It looks in the portal just like a normal NIC, except all of the network function processing associated with floating NIC is managed in the disaggregated pool in Sirius. So with this, we are able to get much larger numbers and in some cases are able to hit card, uh, network capacity limits as well. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going to try to tell you that beyond performance, we have other advantages as well. For example, if you implement new functions in the series, say you implemented multicast support natively in the cloud, then any virtual machine, regardless on which old hardware it is running, it can get, you, get multicast enabled. You can also not wait for newer versions of these smart NICs and run newer smart NICs at lower capacity because spillover can happen into the disaggregated pool. This is also a vendor neutral design, so if a new vendor comes up with a better DPU, we can take that and add it into the appliance. Or we can use a combination of vendors as well. Here are some of the key challenges. The core of the work is how to do stateful network processing fast in the DPU. And we use a novel DPU, which if you know Tofino's, it is P4 programmable. But in addition to having this packet processing, we have large DRAM state and new P4 programmable pipelines that can access the DRAM state. By large, I mean tens of gigabytes and millions of connections. A typical concern with disaggregation is higher availability when links or switches or even cards fail. In the usual way, we do redundancy, but we also have some novel techniques, which I'll describe next. So let's step back for a minute and look at the connection architecture. I'm the graph in the middle opens up the highlighted one on the left. And I'm going to look at one of those appliances. So in today's network, in today's network in Azure, each serious appliance is a 3U server with six DPUs in it. Our minimum unit of deployment is a pair of these servers, and they're connected as shown. There's a lot of nuance in the connection topology. The key idea I wanted to take away is that there's enough redundancy. You have access to the state in the card and the NF processing capability in spite of a large number of potential failures, links or switches dying. A typical question that comes up with disaggregation is what does the data path performance look like? Are you making it worse? So let's compare the default data path in Azure with the data path in Sirius. When two VMs talk to each other in Azure, their SRIOE mapped into the NIC, and all the network function processing goes through the FPGA. Except there's an exception path for new TCPs where connections are bounced into the virtual switch, which changes the state in the FPGA. This is the bottleneck, or this is a current bottleneck. In, the, in Sirius, what happens is the vSwitch is out of the picture, the floating NIC is mapped to a Sirius card, and all traffic is steered from the FPGA to the Sirius card. The card announces the floating NIC's address, so all incoming packets come to the card directly. OK, you know roughly what the data path is. What does the performance look like? We randomly and repeatedly deploy multiple pairs of VMs with both AxelNet and Sirius NICs to normalize placement location. And I'm going to show you latency numbers. If you're using ping or some other kernel application, you don't see any latency difference. Because basically, the host kernel is the bottleneck. And you see numbers roughly in the millisecond range. On the other extreme, if you implement something like a DPDK bouncer, 
which eats up your core, eats up your neck, but bounces, you get really small latencies, tens of microseconds. And here, the extra physical data path of going to the serious device and back adds and shows up. It's tens of microseconds. But what happens to TCP connections? Here you see that Sirius is actually lower latency to set up a new TCP connection. So any addition in the physical data path is more than offset by the reduction in control plane latency in setting up the connection. So Sirius is actually faster than doing this through the virtual switch. Here are the throughput numbers. These are two different VM sizes. Each VM size comes with network capacity limit. And we show that both Sirius and the default data path achieve the capacity limit with a small number of iPerfs. We could do better with the custom application. We just used iPerf. So if a state on the card is lost, if a card dies or somehow becomes unreachable, what happens to TCP connections that are mapped to that card? They'll have to get reset. So how do you protect this state? The typical idea is to replicate state but we replicate between pairs of cards. So all packets go through the primary card, except for state changing packets, such as SINs and FINs, which are pinged to the secondary card, which updates its local state and pongs it back. There are nuances in the paper. This is safe. Nothing bad happens, and maybe a SIN has to be retransmitted if it's lost somewhere in the, in the uh, ping pong. But the main takeaway I'd like you to see is that we're running at hundreds of millions of connections. So the primary cannot buffer a SIN until the secondary says it has accepted its state. So there's no additional data buffering happening here. The primary just pings it back directly from the P4 data path, and the packets come back. So we're using the network as a, as a buffer, if you will. Relative to other works that kind of do this, we are much more performant because the, the path between the primary and secondary cards are much smaller than doing it off of a server somewhere else in the data center. Here's what the card looks like. Um, the ASIC is in the middle. On the top are the DD, uh, DRAM uh, banks. It's a two times 100 gig interfaces coming in. And there are ARM cores as well. In a bit more detail, for those of you who've seen Tofino data sheets before, the bottom path is identical to a Tofino data sheet. You have network interfaces coming in, ingress and egress pipelines, stage local memory, and, a and packet buffer. But the top path is all new. You have new match processing unit stages that can read the DRAM. There's a lot of caching layers inbuilt. There's access into the uh, ARM cores. There's knock interconnects. There's offload special. So just walking you through an example of what a stateful load balancer with NAT looks like. So if you've seen Silk Road or one of these other Tofino offload papers, effectively this is a dictionary lookup. You take a packet and you look it up for what the packet has been NATed to. So I'm going to tell you what the differences are in what we've implemented in the Pensando. So instead of doing everything in the MPU, which you would have to do in a Tofino, we defer the state change to the ARM core. So if a hit misses, the ARM core gets the packets. We also normalize the rewrite table because there are many more flows than unique rewrites. So this reduces the amount of memory we need to keep. That's why we have two tables instead of one table. We are also able to do multiple rewrites in parallel. So we do a lot of NCAP decapsulation. So the encapsulation can happen in parallel to rewrite of the IP header because we do bitwise zoring on the packet before we transmit out. There are a couple other things in the paper. The two things I would want to highlight is that we have production measurements of network function load in Azure over a long period of time. Uh, please take a look. We also have a, a, a more nuanced app description of how failover is handled when a primary card fails and how we can do this fast, quickly and without losing a lot of context. So this is our current status. Anyone who wants to can sign up for and run an experiment for themselves in Azure today. Here's a demo of what you might see when you do that. I'll come back to the demo, sorry. Okay, 
So I'll talk over. So basically what's happening is we are showing you two NICs. Uh, on the left are T-Rex clients. Uh, T-Rex is a DPDK-based application. Uh, on the left is the server, and on the right is the client. Uh, I'm going to start off the load on the server here, and uh, on the client, I'm going to ask for 1.75 million CPS in open loop. Uh, please pay attention to the, uh, the packets being sent by the client and the server. Uh, please also pay attention to the total CPS that the client is reporting. It will hit 1.75 million CPS. This is higher than the numbers reported in the paper. Look at the number of active flows. Almost half of 1.75 million CPS is active. Uh, also look at the total number of open flows that are running in the experiment. So you've already seen experiments that look like the ones on the right, where we have uh, stuff in Azure. There are other experiments that put network virtual appliances into Sirius. But I'm going to show you new experiments in the lab, where we have two pairs of cards in a primary secondary backup pair. And we use Ixia breaking point traffic generators that push line rate traffic. So the graphs you're seeing here, on the left is TCP, and on the right is UDP. They're open load, open loop load. Uh, on the left, we are pushing millions of con TCP connections. And if the card can't keep up, it'll drop packets or keel over. And on the right, we are putting a large number of concurrent connections and round robin packeting between the number of connections. So what you see is 3 million CPS happens with very low loss. Remember, the connections are being duplicated between the primary and secondary. So each card is handling 6 million. And on the left, what you're seeing is we, we are able to take up 100 gigabits per second. Each packet gets VXLAN end capped, so 50 plus million PPS is full line rate. And we're achieving full line rate at 64 million concurrent connections. Um, so that uses many tens of gigabytes of DRAM state. We can also change the power levels on our card. So some power levels seem to be just just fine, just a small change, but there's an issue with the lowest power level which we're still debugging in TCP connections. The last result I'm going to show you is how we perform under faults. Uh, we do plant switchover of state from card one to card two. We have a case where TOR 1's links are broken. This is to show redundant connectivity. And we have a case where card one is dead. This is the unplanned failover. We're looking at the number of flows that break, the packets that get dropped, and how quickly we recover. Most of the packet drops have happened due to route reconvergence, and reconvergence is fast. So to wrap up, uniquely we've decoupled what network function processing rates can be achieved from resources that are available on the virtual machine. We can also lower cost. We can make it easier for VMs to be deployed anywhere. There's some novel techniques, and the performance is uh, state of the art and available for use right now.